Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? They're, they're running and trying to get the screen right, so we're just going to go and get started and, and wing with it while they're working on the screen, and that way we don't lose any time out. So welcome to getting started with Google Analytics. Has it, how many people use Google Analytics already? Just to kind of gauge. OK, awesome, great job. So before we get started, a real quick about me. That's me. That's my daughter. She's actually sitting in the back. She comes with me to all these events. So I am the developer of a plugin called WP Health. And I'm also an adjunct professor at the University of Florida, where I teach web development. And I'm the co-organizer of WordCamp Jacksonville. So, <laughs> so before we get into things, I want to briefly talk about what is analytics for those that don't use any analytics yet. So analytics is a way to determine how, what pages are being viewed the most and what actions are being taken on your page. So analytics, at the most basic level, every time someone loads a page that has Google Analytics on it, Google Analytics calls a URL and it sends a little bit of data. It's called a hit. So this hit sends over what browser the user is using, what page they're viewing, um, what actions they might have taken on the page, what language their browser is setting. And this, this hit happens every time the page is loaded. So that's how analytics work at a very basic level. The page gets loaded, a hit gets sent to a URL that Google Analytics owns, and it sends some data about the user. Now in, in the world, so that's pretty much what I just said. We're going to skip to the next slide here. There's actually many, many different analytics platforms. You might have heard a couple of these. There's Google Analytics, which we're going to talk about. There's Clicky. There's Mixpanel down here, Mixpanel. There's Fathom, Kissmetrics. There's a lot of other analytic platforms out there. We're talking about Google Analytics because it's not only the most popular, but it's also free. And I like free, and probably most of you like free. And Google Analytics, if you ever go to try to get advertisement or affiliates or try to sell your site, people tend to trust Google Analytics data more than some of the lesser known analytic platforms. If you're using some of these, they're still at the top tier of Google Analytics, but you find some of the, the lesser known ones, they might not trust that data as much as Google Analytics. So that's why most people start with Google Analytics. Right, you, can, you can keep playing with it. I'm just going to keep running while you're. All right, so there's, a, there's three different definitions that you want to know before you really jump into any analytic platform. So within in Google Analytics, you have your Google Analytics account. So this is something you use to log in, your Gmail, your Google Calendar, wherever you have Google Analytics, any Google account, you have your Google account that you log into. Well, inside Google Analytics, there's also an account in there. And inside there, you can have multiple accounts. So think of this as like your business account. And if you take on clients, so maybe you're a freelancer or you're a marketer, you can have a different account inside Google Analytics for each of your clients. So if you run two businesses, you might have two accounts, one for each of your businesses. But they're both inside your one Google Analytics account. And then inside that account, there's something called properties. And what properties are, are individual sites or individual apps within that account. So maybe you have your you have your marketer or your business owner who has two accounts in there. So you might have two accounts. And then inside each of those accounts, you might have a property. And that's the website. So, so for example, we're going to look at, at, at Google Analytics in just a minute. But I have inside there, I have an account called Corso Industries, which is one of my companies. And inside there, we have a property for one of my websites. And then I have another property for another one of the websites underneath that company. Or you have two accounts, maybe for two different clients. And then each of those might have only a single property that is a single website. Now, inside there, that's, that's fine. You, you guys keep running. We'll keep going. So inside the properties, and this, if this is a little confusing, it'll make sense once we look at Google Analytics. So just trust me. It'll make sense once we get there. But inside the properties, there's something called views. So essentially, how Google Analytics works is every time that hit gets fired and it gets sent in, that data gets sent into Google Analytics, and it looks through the views that are part of the property and determine where do we need to collect this data. So normally, there is a a view called raw data or all website data. And pretty much everything you need is going to go in that view. But you could create other views to focus on other things. So you could have a view that only shows traffic that was people referred from social media. And then every time you look at it, it's only going to be people from social media. Or you can have a view that is only mobile browsers. So it's only going to have data relevant for, for people who's viewing your website on your mobile phone. And these are a variety of views that you can play with. And even better, you can have different filters, which we'll get to later on, where you can have, hey, this view, don't have me included in the data, and don't have any spam bots, don't have anything like that. So you can have views set up for different purposes. The one we're clicking on whenever you get to it is the one in the top left. 
Now, once we get past those, the account, the property and view, does that make sense, the account, property and view, how those are different? Does anyone have a question on that before we? No? Okay. So once we get to the actual data, there's a few other definitions we want to talk about. One is the difference between user and session. So a user is a unique person who comes to your website. So if I go to your website, I will be counted as one user. Google Analytics knows this because when I load the web page, it's going to put a cookie in my browser. So the next time I go to it, it'll go, hey, there's that cookie there. This is a returning user. So if I clear my cookies, or I switch to a different browser, or go to a different phone, I'll be counted as a second user when I go to your site, and not a returning user. So that's something to remember. Users, it's usually counted as one. I'm a single user, but it's based off a cookie in my browser. So if I clear my cookies, or if I'm in incognito mode, or anything along those lines, then I could be counted as multiple users. Now inside there, there's something called a session. Now a session is what the time that I'm on your website. So if I go to your website today, and I go through your site, go to view all your pages, maybe buy something, and then I leave, that is my one session. Everything I did in there is in one session. If I come back next week and do some other things, that's a separate session. So I've had two different sessions on your site even though I'm one user. Something to remember is session is counted, it stops counting after 30 minutes of inactivity. So if I'm on your website and I'm doing some cool stuff, and then I leave, and then it will wait 30 minutes, and then if I don't come back or do anything, then it's going to go, okay, that's the end of the session. So in the morning time, if I'm on your site doing some cool stuff, and then I get distracted and I go away for 30 minutes, and then I come back, it'll restart a second, then I'll have two sessions during that day. So that's something to keep, you can change that. I don't recommend going that, because everything else, all the math in the world is based off that 30 minutes, so I don't recommend that. But, so that just, just be aware that it's, the cutoff's usually 30 minutes. So that's user, that's session. Did you have a question on that? Yeah, I do. Just inactivity, so you go, so maybe you have videos on your website, and someone goes to your website, and, they're, and you have this hour-long video, and they click play, and they watch the whole thing. Well, by the time they do something else on your website, it'll be a second session, because it'll be considered inactive. So in that case, you might want to change the default. But it's just 30 minutes of inactivity. So if they're just sitting on your page, maybe a really long page, or you have a book or something that's taking a long time to consume, it could still cut off the session if it's inact, if they're not getting hits in. Yes, do you have a question? Okay. Mm -hmm. In most cases, we'll count you twice. There's some newer things coming out where there's cross browser user. We're not going to touch on that in this song, but by default, it would count you twice because you're in two different browsers with two different browser cookies. But Google Analytics is working on, I'm not going to get into it because it's more advanced, but essentially, there will be ways that you could have it set up as one user, but by default, it'd be two different users. All right, so did you close out? Okay, I see what you did. That's fine. And it'll be the one in the top left once it opens up. Yes, did you have a question? Yeah, be yes, most of the syncing, some, depending on the browser, depending on the settings, there's, there's a variety, of, but most browsers would sync like um, history and cookie, or history and bookmarks and things like that. They don't always sync the cookies. So in that case, it wouldn't apply because it's the browser cookie that's important. Um, okay, here, we're, we're just going to switch this way. So I'm not going to sit here and try to log. Yeah, I have the PDF already downloaded just in case. So we can. So it is this one right there if you want to. So, so there's this if you want to try it there, but if not, you can, there, there's a PDF. Okay, so after that, there's two other definitions we want to talk about before we actually look at Google Analytics. So the next is the page view and the event. So by default, mostly everything we talked about so far is a page view. So if someone lands on a page and they view your page, that's considered one page view. If they go to a different page, that's a, page, a different page view of that other page. So if I am in, I'm one user and I have one session and I view five different pages, it'll be five page views during that session. An event is an action I take on your website. So you can track some of the actions I take on your website. So maybe you have a video and I click play and then I watch the whole video, or I pause it halfway through, 
or I download a PDF they have on your website, or I make a transaction, I purchase something. Those are all events that you can also track inside Google Analytics. So this would be a separate thing from page views. Page view by default is the only thing it collects by default, and that would be just me going through web pages. But you can set up event tracking so you can also track some of the actions that are taking on the website. Does that sort of make sense? What is an impression? I'm sorry? So impression, page views, it's mostly, there's some nuance there, but for our purposes, it's pretty much the same. All right, so we're running out of definitions to go over, so hopefully we're almost to the point that we can go into Google Analytics. But there's, so there's three ones left, so you have three definitions. So, we can, so in the steps of the funnel, you might be aware of something called a marketing funnel. So essentially you have, no matter what kind of website you have, you probably want people to come view your website, and there's probably some action you want them to take on your website. Whether it's sign up for your mailing list or buy a product, there's something along those lines. So this, in marketing, there's this funnel of people that you're trying to get attention, people that are on your website, and people who are doing the thing you want them to do. So this is the concept of the funnel. In Google Analytics, they have this same process, and it looks like we're almost there. OK, uh, that's not what I'm using. I'm using the other piece. Ooh. Awesome. Thank you, gentlemen. So this, in Google Analytics, this is how they view the funnel. They use these three terms, acquisition, behavior, and conversion. So acquisition is how users are getting to your site. Behavior is what they are doing on your site. And conversion is users who are completing the actions you want them to take. So I'll let you take a moment to take a picture, and then we'll switch back. If you need, did everyone get what they needed? Yes, I will have the slides. I actually have the URL for the slides in these slides, so you'll, you'll get it at the end. Is everyone good? So just in case you wanted the last couple pictures, or just wanted to see how these worked out, this was the account property and view. They kind of go within each other in case you missed that. And these slides will be available, so you don't need to take pictures of every slide if you don't need to. And then in case you miss anything I was talking there, it was user sessions, page views, and events. Did everyone understand the difference of all these definitions before we get to the actual data? Because that's, it's, this is the backbone of Google Analytics, so you really need to understand these concepts. Does, everyone, does anyone have a question on any of these, these couple of slides here? OK, awesome. So let's take a look around. And we are not on a laptop that's logged in. Um, that's fine. That's fine. I accounted for this. I have screenshots in case it didn't work. So. So when you log into Google Analytics, we're not going to get to play with all of it because I'm not logged in on this laptop, but I have screenshots as backup. So when you log in, you'll have this left sidebar that divides in the same concept. There's acquisition right here. There's behavior right underneath that is, ac is conversion. So those three tabs will line up with this funnel. So what you're looking for, if you're going, hey, I want to know how people are getting to my website, that's acquisition. You'll go to the acquisition tab. If you're looking for, hey, what are the people doing on my website, that'll be underneath behavior. If you're looking at, hey, what are the conversions? People who bought from my site, how did they get here? You look at conversion. So those are the three terms you'd want to remember. And that lines up exactly with this little guy over here, this acquisition and behavior. And then right underneath this would be conversion. So when you first sign in, there's, depending on how you've set up Google Analytics, there might be a few different things you might see when you first log in. But by default, you might be on this real-time tab. Unless you really know Google Analytics, I advise you don't even play with this tab. Use it for checking. Make sure, oh, OK, I'm on my site. I show up. I know it's working. But on that, I've, I've met people who spend, leave this tab open pretty much all day. And they'll just watch. Oh, there's someone on my website. Oh, there's someone on my website. What are they doing? Oh, they're on this page. Well, at the end of the day, that actually means nothing to you. You're not going to take any actions from that. You're just wasting time. So don't, don't fall in the trap of playing on this page. It's really cool. It's nice for testing if you're trying to do something and make sure it works. But on that, don't, don't play with this unless you really know what you're doing. So from there, there's the audience along the left. So real time is what I was just talking about. Right underneath that is audience. In there is where you can get some demographic information about the people that are on your site. So what language they're set up their browsers in, what operating systems, if they're on a phone or a tablet, a um, variety of things such as that. If you synced up advertising features, which we we'll might go over at the end depending on time, then underneath some of these other options down here, you could even get some interests and some age range information. That's only if you've turned on those options, though. But so audience is about your users. 
Next, acquisition, then that's the next part, that's that very top part of the funnel is how people are getting to my website. So you'll see something like this when you first jump on, and then you'll have these acquisition channels. So by default, Google knows if something's coming from social media, in most cases. They know if someone's coming by referral. So if someone mentions you on their website or they link to you somewhere, that's, that would be a referral. They also track search. So maybe if someone searches for you and they, you show up in the search listings and they get to your website. But they don't track by default something like email. So if you send an email, if you have a link in your signature, Google Analytics doesn't know where that comes from. Same thing as if you send out marketing campaigns and you have links, go, hey, go buy my product now or subscribe to this or, or you're trying to get them to read an article. By default, that's going to go underneath a channel, which is not picture, or right there in the middle, called direct. So right now, if you were to type in your website name, you go um, frankcorso.com, frankcorso.me, you hit enter, and then Google Analytics goes, hey, I don't know where this person came from. They must, be, they must have typed it in directly, which would make sense in my case. But when they can't figure out where I came from, so if I clicked on a link in an email and I get there, they don't know where I came from. They're going to, oh, they must have typed it in directly. So all that, everyone that clicks on links in email or anywhere else will by default go into direct. So something you'll want to, if you do anything like that, you want to look into something called UTM codes, which we're going to briefly go over towards the end. But that'll be the way you can get things underneath email or even an other, depending on what you're trying to do. And then next is behavior. So this is where a lot of the events and things that are taking place on your website. So if you have a WordPress site, you might have a little search box somewhere on your website, maybe on the navigation or maybe on the sidebar where someone can search for something. If you turn it on in Google Analytics, you can go to site search and see what everyone is searching for on your website. So you can go there and be like, oh, everyone's searching for this, and I don't have that on my website. I should probably create that content. If you're doing event tracking, you can go to events, and you can see what people are doing on your website, see what videos people are watching, seeing what downloads they're downloading, what PDFs they're viewing. Whatever the case may be, you would do that underneath events. Frank, if I, if I may. Yes. You went over the behavior real quick. You mentioned something may not be on your site that people look for. Which part was that? So this right over on the left here, there's this little site search. If you click on that, you'll get a table of everything people are searching for on your website. On your website? On your, on your website. So if, yeah, whatever website you have as the property, then the, whatever they search for will show up there. As long as you turn it on in the options, which I'll try to show you towards the end. But there's just an option when you're creating your property just to turn on site search logging or site search tracking. And then you would just go to this site search, and it will show up right there for you. Yeah, so a, a use case may be maybe you have a, a website with articles on it, and maybe your big thing is content marketing. So you can go, maybe you are talking about, um, I have a client right now who does the keto, um, I don't K-E-T-O, you might be familiar with that, the keto. Yeah, so it's a very popular thing, and there's people that come to the website, and they're, they're, searching, they're reading articles, they're really enthusiastic about it, but then they were searching for um, this particular method of keto or some sort of recipe, and they, they kept searching. They wouldn't find it. We looked in there and realized it was massively searched for, so we created that content. So that way, the next person that searched for it would see it. So that was that use case. But there's lots of use cases that, while, where knowing what people are searching for would probably be handy. You're welcome. OK, I don't have a screenshot for conversions, but essentially conversions would be a similar to report to this, where it would show what action, what goals people have completed. So if your goal is people buy something on your website, you would set up like e-commerce, and then you would see how many people have bought something on your website and where do they come from. And then you would also see if your goal is to get someone to subscribe to your mailing list, you could go to conversion, and you would see some chart of going, hey, this is the number of people that signed up for your mailing list, and this is where they came from. So it's audience, acquisition, behavior, and conversions are the main areas that you'd be looking at. Does that sort of make sense? Do you, yes? Uh, you have to tell Google Analytics this is, these are the events that the actions that you take Yes. These are the tasks that I'm going to mention that very towards the end. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a slide for that one, but I do have some information on how to find that towards the end of the talk. So any questions on where, what section you might go to, depending on what you're looking for? Yes, go ahead. Could you explain behavior again? Sure. Anything they do on your website usually goes underneath behavior. So here we can see what pages are most viewed, which is right here. And if you go into the site content, there's a, a report there called Top Pages. And you can see the, most page, the pages that got viewed the most. 
If you have events set up, you can go to events and see what actions they're taking on your website. If you have search, you can go to the search and see what people are searching for. So it's pretty much what are they doing on your website? What pages are they viewing? What links they might be clicking? What are they downloading? Anything along those lines. Yes, go ahead. So would you classify an event like a button that's clicked? Like if you have a call to action, would that be an event? Whether that be send an email, go to a form? Yes and no. Um, events can be whatever you define, which we're only going to touch on that a little bit in this talk towards the end. Okay. But essentially, if you Anything that just goes to another page, you don't need to because then you'll, that's going to just be another page view. But if you click on something and it does something, or like you click on it to open up a pop-up for them to sign up to a mail list, you probably want to know how many people click on that button. So that you would probably do it as an event. So it would be some action they take that doesn't necessarily go to a different page. Okay. Yes? Sure. So in Google Analytics, when you set up your view in Google Analytics, you can turn on site search tracking. And then anytime anyone searches for something on your WordPress site, you can go to the site search report, and it'll list out everything people have searched for. Is that not somebody searching on Google site to open the domain? No, no, that's or? on your site. So if there's a search box on your site, they type in something, it'll show up right there. That's not in Google search. It's No. So this is if someone's searching on your WordPress site and it's using the search functionality in WordPress. It's not anything to do with Google search. That would be the search functionality on your WordPress site. And that works by default just because WordPress is set up to work by default. If you've gone in and make changes using like some of the search plugins, that might not work right away. There might be some extra things. But by default, that'll work. Just for, you just have to turn it on. Yes? A lot of us build websites for clients customers. Yes. Yes. I don't know how many clicks they got. I mean, how many that be taken by? So uh, I set up Google Analytics through my own account. Is there a way that I've not found yet to give a third party individual access or read only access to my Google Analytics? Yes. Sharing? I'm going to go over that right after we get to the setting up, but there's, there's things you can do to make that much easier. So we'll, we'll go over that, and if I don't, we'll circle back towards the end. So just in case for those who haven't set it up yet, whenever you create your account for the first time, you'll see something like this. If you already have Google Analytics set up, you would go to the admin way down here in the bottom. So there's an admin, and you'll see something like this. When you're on this screen, you can create new accounts by clicking the Create Account button. You can create new properties by clicking the Create Property button. Or you can click Create View to create new views. Once you have something set up, you can click this Tracking Info to get to a Tracking Code section. Give me just a moment to finish my train of thought. And then from there, you'll use that in a few places, which I'll go over in just a moment. Yes, what's your question? Does it have to be a WordPress site? Or it be this can be anything. Shopify, Squarespace, Magento, Drupal, something you coded by hand, something you did in, what was that, um, Dreamweaver, you know, whatever, whatever you feel like using. <laughs> Any questions on, let me, all right, let me, is it about this or can I finish this training? Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, would you make them a view or would you make them a property? So if you're doing client work, mm -hmm. you're going to do this a little bit differently than this is, if this is your own. For me personally, what I like to do is I have an account for my sites, and then I have different accounts for each of the clients. And that way, if anything happens that I need to transfer all that ownership to someone else, I can just transfer that account and don't have to go through, wait, which property is mine? Which property is theirs? Which, and it just makes things easier. Mm -hmm. But you could do it either way, and then, but inside there, you would set up a property for each of the client sites. And then inside there, you'd have a view for each of their properties. And we're going to go on views in just a moment. But so essentially, just depending on. There are. Uh, I want to say it's like 50, though. Like it's a pretty high number. So depending on what you're trying to do, that you probably won't hit that right away. If you have 60, 70 clients, then you might want to do things differently. But I. Do you have 50, 60 clients? OK. So then in that case, for now, sticking to that method is probably easiest. Can I just build on that question for a second? Um, if you have multiple clients, mm -hmm. is it not better in the client's interest to set them up their own account with you having admin rights to it in case you don't stay with that client, they take all their data and they go their happy way? 
so how this works is these can be attached to multiple Google Analytic, Google accounts. So if you're doing this for the best interest of the client, when you create this account, you can set them up as also admin users. So you both have admin users, and they, if you transfer ownership to them right away, then essentially they're the primary owner, and you're a secondary owner, and they can boot you off whenever they need to. So that would be the best way to do it, to handle that case. Um, depending, it just depends on what kind of relationship you have with your clients. and how. What, no, so essentially, so this, the Google Analytics account is different than a Google account. So this kind of lives out here, and you can have multiple Google Analytics accounts attached, or Google accounts to attached to it. So you can have three different Google accounts as admins for a Google Analytics account. Does that sort of answer the question? I know it's a little confusing because they both are called accounts, but okay. One more question, then we have to move on. We're not going to quite touch on that, but so Google Search Console is a separate thing. But um, underneath, I'm not, it's a several slides back, but underneath behavior, no, acquisition, you can actually link them together. So some of the reports from Search Console will show up in, this, in the reports. But unfortunately, that's a whole different tool, so we're, we're not going to touch on that too much in this talk. OK, so setting up Google Analytics, there's a few ways you can do it if you're using a WordPress site. So just remember, before I touch on these, Right here in the middle, there's the property and there's the tracking info. A lot of these tools will need something underneath there. So underneath there, there will be either a code or um, as in like an ID will be UA-8976, something along those lines, or will be some actual little bit of code that you might have to copy and paste. But either way, you'd be going underneath tracking info. And then in there, oh, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. So depending on what you're doing, a lot of themes will have a Google Analytics option inside. So you just copy whatever they ask you to copy, and then paste it. From, so from that tracking info, you copy what you need, and then paste it in your theme settings, and then you'd be done. If your theme does not have a setting, there might be, there's several WordPress, WordPress plugins you can use. So Monster Insights is very popular. Google Analytics Dashboard for WP is also very popular. And those work very similarly in that you just copy a little bit from the tracking info page, paste it in, save it, and you'll be done. And they'll, they'll handle everything else for you. Now, if you're outside of WordPress, maybe you have a client site or you have an extra site. So you have a WordPress site for your marketing site, and then you have a Squarespace for actually selling products or Shopify. All those other services usually have a Google Analytics option in their advanced settings that you can just copy and paste your code into, and you'll be done as well. So it's fairly easy, hopefully, to get it up and running. So once you get it, you copy your tracking info and paste it in, you're going to start getting data in. By default, you'll have this all website data view. So this is the admin page still, and we're focused on the view column over here. There's something called the all website data view. So anyone that goes to your website and any action that gets taken all goes in this all website data view. Always keep that view and never touch it. Because if you accidentally break it and then you log in three weeks from now and realize you weren't tracking any data for three weeks, you're not getting that data back. So always keep that. Uh, like I can't stress this enough. This is probably the most important thing I'll say during this presentation. Keep that view and don't touch it. And what you want to do instead is click this button up here that says Create View. And then you can name this whatever you want. I usually call it Without Me or just Without Spam or Master View or just something that goes, OK, this is the view I can touch and not the other one. And then that way, this other view is whatever you want to do, you can play with that. But if you accidentally break it, you can still fall back on the all website data in case you need that data. So what I recommend doing is clicking Create View and then creating something, so either Master View or Without Me or Without Spam. And when you do it, when you click, so in here in the View Settings towards the bottom, there's a little checkbox that says Exclude Spam and Bots and stuff. You want to check that. And that way, in your Master View, you won't have all this spam data in it. Now, there's a lot of other things you can do with Views. Unfortunately, it's a little bit more advanced, so we're not going to get into that too far. But does that kind of make sense of why you need that second view? Does anyone, is anyone confused by that? Yeah, sort of. Just think of it as like the foundation of all your data. It's the original, it should not be changed. Exactly. So whenever you create a view, it only has the data it collects going forward. So the all website data, as soon as you put in your tracking code, it starts collecting, collecting data. But then the view, if you wait six months to create this master view, the master view will only have data from that point going forward. So you still want to refer back to the all website data for that older data. So it's, it's like the foundation, I would probably say. So within views, what makes views really amazing 
is you can have different views set up for different purposes, and you could use something called a filter to filter some of the data out. So for example, so underneath the views, we have view settings, user management, goals, content, and then there's this option here called filters. Inside there, you can set up different filters go, hey, don't add me into the data, or don't add this known spam bot into the data, or don't add anyone from desktop. Maybe I only want to see mobile users in this view. You would use those filters to create that kind of differences in the data. So let me see. On this left screenshot would be if you had filters, you could have this table here. So in this example, I have, I'm excluding some language spam that's common in Google Analytics. I'm filtering out my own laptop and my own desktop. I have a spam filter I set up. And then I set up something called force lowercase. And we're going to go over UTM codes towards the end. But you can actually modify some of the data as it comes in using filters. So my, the first one that I usually recommend is if you click Add Filter, you get a little screen like this where you can click Predefined or Custom. If you click Predefine and click IP Address, you can add, enter your IP address of your desktop, and it will exclude you from that view. So when you go there, you won't see you showing up in the data influencing your numbers. So that's usually the first one I recommend if you have a desktop. If you have a laptop, you move around a lot. That it won't be so super helpful. But if you have a desktop, that's usually the first thing you should be doing. So that's, a, that's filters in a nutshell. I know we're, we're already almost to the question and answer time, so I don't have time to explore that too much. But is, filters and views kind of make sense? OK. Do you at least understand the concept? So if you know, hey, I need to do this, this is what I need to research? Do you know it well enough to do OK, awesome. OK, dashboards. This is, if you do client work, this is, you need to like really pay attention. If you ignore me the rest of the talk, this is the time to listen. So dashboards are this really, if you go, have you ever played Google Analytics? You could probably spend three weeks looking at the data and still have no idea what you just looked at. And it's very overwhelming. So dashboards are a way that you can go, hey, I just need to see these three numbers. I just need to know, maybe I have a goal in mind. I want to get increase my social media traffic so I get more sales. So you create this dashboard, and then you can go, OK, I want this little box to tell me how many unique visitors I had last week. This little box tell me how many total visits. And maybe this box tell me the keywords people are searching for. And you just want this box to tell me how many people bought stuff. Maybe that's all you need to know. So you can create a dashboard, create little boxes, and go, hey, this is the report. I only need to look at this. And that way, it removes all that extra noise. And you can create this little guy that just goes, hey, this is a little tiny box. That's all I need to pay attention to. Now, that may seem overwhelming going, I don't know what numbers I need. Because you might not know that right away. Well, the beautiful thing is, is when you go into this, when you create your first one, there's this little starter dashboard. You can click on that, and it'll pre-populate all those boxes for you. Even better, you can click Import from Gallery. And then there's all these user templates that users have created for different purposes. So you can go, I want to increase my content marketing growth. So you can click Import from Gallery, type in Content Marketing, and you'll find a dashboard suited for that goal. If you want to type in Social Media, you find a dashboard that's already pre-created, designed to help you focus on social media numbers. So whatever your goal is, you can click Import from Gallery, type that, and at least get started. And then once you understand dashboards a little bit more and you see how they all work, then maybe start making tweaks to it. But to get started, I would recommend importing from gallery and just typing whatever you're focused on at the time. Now, and then in the last slide, there's this last point right here. If you do client work, this is amazing. So essentially, with the dashboards at the top here, there's this little email button. You can click email, and you type in an email address, and it'll send out. That's, that sounds great in itself. But then there's this little option underneath that goes, oh, on a, on a regular basis. So you can check this and go, oh, every, every Monday, send this report out. And then you, so what you do is every Monday you get this dashboard emailed to you. And then you glance it over and then type a few sentences for analysis and send it off to your client. And they're like, wow, you must have been spending weeks on these. This is amazing. <laughs> and it, it, I'm telling you, it works. So it's, but even if it's just for yourself, just having it emailed to you every single Monday and going, okay, all I have to do is just look at this dashboard and I know everything I need to know, that if you came into this going, oh, Google Analytics is overwhelming, knowing you can do that is probably a sigh of relief, because that is an amazing experience. All right, we only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to touch on UTMs real quick. So getting better data with UTMs. UTMs, if you haven't encountered these before, and remember, these slides will be available after, so you don't have to. <laughs> so UTMs, so way back, way back when, decades ago, there was this platform called Urchin Web Analytics. And they used this cool thing called an Urchin Tracking Module. Well, then Urchin Web Analytics was bought by Google and changed its name to Google Analytics and then became like the de facto standard. So now every other analytics platform in the world all uses the same thing because it's so popular. So you can use this pretty much on any analytics, pla pla an analytics platform. And if you create these to use it at Google, at Google Analytics and you move to another analytics, pla analytics platform, it will automatically work because it's the standard. 
So this is the way that you can get specific data instead of everything falling into that direct channel that I mentioned earlier. You can use this to go, hey, this link, I want to say, I want to know exactly what this does, and this is the way I want Google Analytics to report it. So for example, you could track how many people click your email signature. You could track, you can test which links in your email marketing converts the most customers. So maybe you send out an email with a new product, and you have a link at the top and a link at the bottom, or you have this three email sequence that are kind of setting up this new product. You can see which link out of all of those people actually clicked on, and which of those links people clicked on that actually went on to buy something, or do whatever you needed them to do. You would use UTMs to do this. So there's five parts of a UTM. Campaign is the actual name that you want to give this campaign. So it might be Spring Sale, Spring Sale 2019, or my new product, or whatever you want to name it, you can, this is entirely up to you, but it will be whatever name you want to see when you go into Google Analytics and you go to acquisition, you, there's a, there'll be a new campaign report, and then so they'll be all funneled underneath the campaign name. So if you have all these different, if you have Spring Sale 2019, and then maybe Book Launch, or um, new, I don't know, whatever, but any of those other campaigns, whatever you wanted to see there so you know what this is, you would want to name it as the campaign here. The medium is the type of platform. So th in this case, it would be something like email or social or um, CPC if you're doing cost per click ads. Something along those lines, what is the medium that is being used with this link? And then source would be the actual platform. So if you have something where a medium is social, then source might be Twitter or Facebook. If you have medium as CPC, uh, cost per click ad, then the source might be Google ads or Bing ads. Um, if you have a medium of email, the source might be the exact email. So maybe it's um, book launch email number one or something to that effect. Now, content is this optional one that you can use to differentiate between links that have the same campaign medium and source. So maybe you have a campaign called book launch, and then you have a medium of email, and you have a source of book launch email one. But you have two links in there. So they'll both have the same thing. So you can use content as link one and link two. So you can see the data that's different between those two links. Or maybe you have two different Facebook posts linked to the same thing. So you can have some campaign like book launch, medium of social, source of Facebook, but then post one and post two. So you can compare how those posts did in, the actual over, in your actual conversion rates. Now the term, we're not going to dive into that, but that's used more for paid keywords and ads. If you use CPC, cost per click ads, Google ads, you'll want to look more into that to track the keywords that are being ranked for. So here's a quick example. I know we're almost out of time. So maybe you want to, oh, went too fast. I went to send out an email newsletter with a new posts with multiple links. So I had this URL. I had posted this article a while ago now. So that was the URL. And then I have a campaign that I named it the same exact name as the post, because that was just my big push at the time. So campaign, what should you write about? My medium was email. The source was the new post broadcast. That's what I named the email. And then I had a content, because I had two different links. I had a main link, and then I had a secondary link towards the bottom. And so that created a URL that looked like this. So when someone clicked on that, that's the URL that would go to. And Google Analytics would see all these, param all these extra things in the URL and go, OK, I need to collect that data too. Now, if you look at that and go, wow, that's a lot to type out. And I, I'm going to make a spelling error. I can guarantee it. Don't worry. There's a UTM builder for that. So if you search, I don't have any listed here, mainly because there's thousands of them. But if you Google search Google URL builder, it's like the very first one is made by Google. And then the second one's made by Facebook. And the third one's made by Bing. So it's, you can pretty much trust that those are going to work exactly the way you need them to. But all of them work slightly differently, and they have these different colors. So I don't usually recommend one. So I just play with The one I use is the Google URL Builder. But you can just, if you just search UTM Builder or URL Builder, you will find pages of them. So just find one you like. Yes. Yes. And you could theoretically, to not to go too advanced and crazy, but you could have this override some of the defaults. So maybe you want to group a variety of different social, social referrals and stuff together underneath a campaign. Maybe you have a big spring launch sale. And you want to go, hey, don't put this in social. Don't put this in direct. Don't put this way over here. You can override it using UTMs as well. Is there a discussion about whether it's better to use campaigns or is there, is that discussion? So, Campaign, so UTMs go underneath acquisition. This is how people get to your website. Events is what happens on your website, so that's behavior. So these would, you, you actually use these together in most cases. Yes? I've seen these UTMs a million times and didn't know what they were. When I share a link mm -hmm. to something, I always back up to the question mark and get rid of it 
Okay. Well, so all you're doing, it, so if it's not your site, then that's okay. Because then you're just going, hey, I don't care if HubSpot knows where it came from. Exactly. But if it's your own site, you probably want to be a little bit more careful of exactly what's in there, depending on what your objectives are. Right. And are they being auto-generated? Like when, when I post something on Facebook mm -hmm. and somebody else clicks on it, so well, no, they, so they don't auto-generate. So by default, if you don't have UTMs there, then it'll do the default Google Analytics. So if someone clicks on it, it'll just go underneath social, and Google kn and knows that it's from Facebook, but then it won't know a campaign to put it under. That's the only difference. So this is only to help you better categorize your data and get a little bit more from it, but it's not needed. By default, Google Analytics will do a lot of this itself. And so when, when I do a MailChimp campaign... That's where you definitely want to use it. Because so you have to auto you have to manually generate these UTMs on each link. Yes. It's not being generated by No. Mail now, some mail email list providers, I think MailChimp also has it. There's a little UTM add UTM tags option when you paste your link in. So you can just like type in these couple things and then it'll create the URL for you right there as you put it in. But not all of them do that. I don't know if MailChimp does. I want to say it does, but that'd be you something just to get your analytics for the mailing from MailChimp directly, but it wouldn't be integrated into Exactly, but it also, so for example, if we go back to this example here, maybe I sent out this email newsletter, and maybe the goal of that new post was to get them to buy a product. Well, MailChimp wouldn't have that data. So by having it over here, I can go, hey, I sent out this article, and I saw three people who came from that article bought this product. And I, I wouldn't be able to do that with MailChimp data alone. I'd have to have that in Google Analytics. All right, and we're just out of time. Let me just wrap this up, then I'll tr try to fit some questions in. So where do you go from here? There's a couple things we did not go over. Goals in e-commerce, and e I mentioned these in passing. These are definitely great tools. They're a little bit more advanced, so I wouldn't start with these if you're just getting started. But what you would look for is goals, e-commerce. You can track what is being bought on your site, what category of product, what product itself, things along those lines. Event tracking, just pretty much what we've been talking about with events. Custom dimensions. It's actually a little bit more events. I'm going to get back to that during question and answer. Learn more about filters and views. There's so much more you can do that than even the examples I mentioned. There's also two other tools that Google makes that layers on top of these. So once you know all this stuff, you can go to Google Tag Manager and even include so much more different actions into it. And then you have Google Data Studio, which imports all of your other data from your mailing lists and your Facebook pages and creates even more reports that you can create. I wouldn't recommend starting there. Like start with Google Analytics. But as you go, that's where this is the kind of game plan that you would want to aim for. And last but not least, I have these slides at franksslides.com. That just redirects the slide share. All of my slides are there, so if you want to browse. And then I also have almost all of these, everything I talked about, I have as articles on the frankcorso.me website. So if you're interested in reading more about any of these, you can find it there. And then, of course, I am available. So if you want to hire me to do some Google Analytics stuff, I'm always here. All right, we do have, I think, a couple minutes. I don't know. A couple minutes for questions? Okay, awesome. Yes, go ahead.